September 2001, I was in New York. I awoke to the news, and my friend that I was staying with, um, Doug, we went to the roof of his apartment building and watched the World Trade Center crumble. And both of us simultaneously looked at each other and, um, and said, we have to go down there right now. We were literally running against the current of people that were rushing out of the scene. We were running into the scene. Doug works in the media, so he had uh, media badges that allowed us to get beyond barricades that were just being set up by local police. There was still no support system for these firefighters and these rescue workers. So it became a real necessity that we find food and water really fast. So we um, actually, with, with the support of a couple of um, NYPD um, police officers, we started looting all the nearby delis and supermarkets. And we had turkey meats and we had the finest of New York delis meats and everything. After a while it became clear that there was just one food that all the um, rescue workers wanted and that was peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And I later um, realized that it was because it was comfort food. And it was the first area where they actually did the first roll call. Fire chief stood up on top of one of the crushed fire trucks. There were probably 400 names that he called off, and at least half of them were not present. As the reality set in with all of the firefighters around, that they were not present because they were not alive. They were in the building. Um, they started to literally crumble like dominoes all around us. They fell to their knees, they sat on curbs, and these big hardened men were just in tears. The earth movers came in to clear the way for all of the rescue vehicles, and Wall Street was lined with fine automobiles, so the only way to move them was to literally push them over with these earth movers. They just flipped the cars one at a time, all the way down the road, flipping cars out of the way. And, and I watched these, these material items go from being this beautiful car that I was drilling over to just being trash in seconds. We watched and we just stood there, you know, like 12 guys going, oh my God, how can they do that? But then it became really clear to me that it's like, that was so irrelevant to the task of finding people alive that all of the material world was just garbage at that point. It didn't matter. I had suited up, you know, rescue worker's um, uniform, basically, with the respirator and everything on. And this actually ended up becoming my pass to get into the ground zero, where it was nothing but qualified rescue workers. And here I was just a civilian with really no qualification to be there. So the first victim that was um, found was this little man in a suit, and he had been completely crushed and disfigured under a um, fire truck. And I, I, and I stood there looking at him and imagining what his story must have been that he he likely hit under the thing that felt the most secure like a fire truck do you know what i mean he probably crawled under that fire truck as debris was falling only to be crushed under that fire truck when that entire rig was crushed upon him and so that was really the first sobering moment of wow okay this is what we're here for and this is what we're going to witness and am i up for it and you know, it was, I didn't really even have to think about it. It was just a yes. I finally went to take my first nap in 40 hours, 40 plus hours. I really don't know. It was kind of timeless there. And I found an apartment building that had been completely abandoned. And so I went into the lobby of this apartment building and, um, and I found a couch and I dusted it off and I laid down on the couch with my face against the back of the couch and I, and I cuddled up and I bundled up and and probably about a half hour into um, my sleepless nap, um, I could feel the little man, the first victim that we found, the little man in the suit, I could feel him kneeling behind me. And I could see it vividly. He was kneeling behind me, his disfigured face, staring at the back of my head. I could feel his breath on the back of my neck. And I was pretty, pretty terrified. And I just laid, laid there for, I don't know how long it was, five or 10 minutes just thinking, what is he doing? And I was still and quiet long enough for that voice, that, you know, that voice, whatever you want to call it, my internal voice that said to me very loud and clearly, this could be your Vietnam or dot, dot, dot. And it just left me kind of hanging like that. I didn't know what the dot 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 was, but I knew what the this could be your Vietnam meant. Having grown up, seeing all the ex-vets with all of their um, drama that they brought back from the war and their flashbacks, having just had my first ground zero flashback, 
I knew that this could be something that could stay with me that way for the rest of my life and it could probably trouble my future. Or, and I knew that the answer to the or was back out on the rubble. So I got up and I suited up again and I put my mask on and I, and I walked around the building and as I rounded the corner, they had put up a new work light and it was this very bright, brilliant light. And, and everything just seemed so bright and so brilliant that I was like just struck. And I, I just looked around at all these people and everything, everything just instantly appeared different to me. And I stood there with tears in my eyes. It felt like I was just, it, the world was in slow motion. I was watching people go by and all I could see was just spirits crossing and spirits working and chain gangs of spirits. And it was so clear to me that everything was interconnected and it was all one big body of God. Everybody had dropped their egos, they had dropped their identities, they had dropped their rank, and they were working together for the greater good of all. And I was so lit up with possibility for humankind of what it can be like when we all are working together in this way. And I could really get beyond concept what oneness was. Knowing that the entire world was experiencing what it was experiencing, all the separation and fear and chaos that was going on in the world, here I was standing there experiencing the greatest bliss and beauty of my life. And I just, I remember just wishing that the world could see this situation through my eyes. In that moment, standing there, overlooking ground zero and all the chaos that was going on arose my, my life destiny. All my selfish pursuit of trying to get what I needed to get and be where I needed to be in my life just seemed ridiculous. I knew that from that point on, my life would be about all of us. It would be about community. My heart was so filled with possibility of what we're capable of when we're working from that point. Because I know it's possible, my whole life now has been about recreating that community. It is the, the catalyst for my wanting to create Elevate Film Festival, which is, when you really break it down, it's just a community of people who understand this oneness that I'm talking about. Can we bring people into an experience that's so much bigger than who we think we are? that we can experience that level of oneness. Because when you do, there, there's nothing more beautiful in this lifetime and this experience, there's nothing greater than that. So paradoxically in that moment, while the world was experiencing chaos and confusion and fear, I was standing there experiencing my first true experience with God through giving and the service that I was witness to I had experienced the oneness, the greatest sense of oneness that I ever knew was possible. And from that arose my destiny.